Thank you for tuning in to In the Vine Dating Podcast. Today, we'll be continuing our newest segment called Who's in the Vine, released every Monday, where Melissa will be interviewing different guests to talk about the questions you ask. And remember to follow up every Thursday, where we will further discuss any questions or responses you may have. Please enjoy, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Welcome to our first episode of Who's in the Vine for season two. We are so excited because I have with me Pastor Abraham. Some of you guys know him as Pastor Abraham, as Father Abraham. There's a whole song named after him. (laughs) Um, And so um, for those that are familiar with Pastor Abraham, you know the amount of intimacy that he has with Jesus. You you know the wisdom and just the powerhouse that he is. And so we are just so excited to have him here with Who's in the Vine. And, you know, we said that this season we're going to be focusing in on things such as premarital sex. We're going to talk about soul ties. We're going to talk about servanthood. And Pastor Abraham with the servanthood, like amazing. It's something that, you know, he definitely has bragging rights, but he wouldn't brag, which is why he's here. Um, (laughs) And then he's mentored many men that have dealt with things that um, of those sorts. So we're just excited. So welcome. Thank you. How are you feeling? Great. (laughs) Amazing. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, he doesn't like being in the limelight. So this is a miracle right here. (laughs) Uh, Being a servant. Being a servant. Yeah, Yeah. there you go. So let me open up my notes here and just start out. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay. Well, um, well, my my name's Pastor Abe. Well, not Pastor (laughs) Abraham. My name is Abraham Salcedo. Uh, I'm a pastor at Greater Works Christian Church. A um, little bit about myself. Uh, I've been an employee of a communication company for 24 years. It'll be 20, 25 years this year. Um, happily married to a beautiful woman. In the audience. Named Adriana Salcedo. We have a live audience, audience right this morning, now. evening, afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I have three kids, um, uh, 24, 18, and 17. Um, as far as you know, what we do, you know, being a pastor at Greater Works Christian Church, some of the other things I'm involved with right now is uh, I'm one of the leaders in the Palmdale Freedom Coalition, which is a group in the community that uh, just have united to just uh, stand up and hold our, our city councils and our mayors a- accountable for what's going on in the city. Um, also, uh, you know, mentor some of the some of the young adults. Um, you know, through issues and struggles and sometimes just encouragement and accountability and things of that nature. So um, I have, um, I'm one of four kids. I have three sisters, um, no brothers. And my wife's side of the family is, is, she has no sisters, but has three brothers. I've never noticed so that. I've never. It's one of those ironic things that yeah. happen. And that's why we, I know that, you know, we were supposed to be together. Yeah. But yeah, awesome. it's a little bit about me. It's great stuff. Um, he is, on top of that, on top of all of those things, uh, Pastor Abraham is does so much around the church, right? Just I think when we think about the, the title of pastor, we think of just, if you don't have that much of recollection or if you grow up like in a huge church, then you think pastor is somebody that just shows up on Sunday and preaches. But um, one of the things that I remember hearing when I first even started coming to the church was like, the, the shepherd smells like sheep. Right. That means that you're among the people, you break bread and do all those things. And so um, Pastor Abraham and Pastor Adriana, which we're going to interview next, are amazing examples of this. So so tell me about your family dynamic. How many kids do you have and what are your current endeavors? You already told me. (laughs) Well, um, as far as uh, as far as my kids, their their endeavors, um, our eldest is right now currently in her last semester of law school. Which is amazing. So she will be finishing school and she's like, Dad, I can't wait to be done with school. Yeah. I can't believe that I'm actually, I don't have to go back to school anymore. Yeah. So she's doing great. She's out in Arizona. She goes to um, Arizona State. Um, I have my my son who's currently um, going to ABC. You know, he's, he's taking fire tech to get an associate's yes. degree there. And plus, Yvonne, he's right now he's part of the, um, the fire rangers out here locally. So he's been doing that. And then 
our daughter just recently got accepted to Grand Canyon University. That's amazing. So, I didn't know that. So she'll be going out to, to Phoenix, Arizona to be with my other daughter. Aww. So um, they, they've been doing great. We're just so proud of our kids because, um, you know, we've, we've, everything that we do in life is for our kids, yeah. right? Just as you talk about servanthood, um, you know, as a husband and wife, you serve each other, but you're also serving each other to build up a better life for your children. Yeah. And there's no better aspect of servanthood than to be able to be a, a father and mother and just raise your kids and just give them the best opportunity that you possibly can so that they can flourish. Yes. Right. Our jobs are to train them up, not only in the ways they should go, but also try to create the best possible um, scenario for them to really succeed. Yeah. And so it's just it's exciting. It, you know, sometimes it's nerve wracking at the same time. But uh, but it, it, it's been really joyful. And I, I'm glad to be able to celebrate all these moments that we've had. And pretty soon my wife and I are going to be uh, empty nesters. So oh my goodness. it's a it's going to be a new a new uh season in our lives and my wife and I are just lo looking forward to be able to focus even more on on, on yeah. our relationship and the things that we love to do together. That's awesome. So before we dive into like the servanthood and all that, I know that you touched on it a little bit, but um, you know, you're talking about these amazing things that your kids are doing, right? And we're, we've all seen them grow up and, and just seeing like the, the trials that they themselves have had to overcome. But what I want to ask is like, did you and Pastor Adriana and you and your wife, did you guys come from that kind of family where these results were expected, right? Like, mm. um, tell us about your growing up, your story before getting married and your kids. Yeah, and as far as me, uh, I guess I was, I'm the, the only, only boy, um, if you can say boy nowadays. <laughs> um, I'm the only male in the family. I'm the oldest. Okay. So as far as, uh, as far as with me, I was, pretty much just live life. My parents really didn't say much other than my dad said, don't, um, don't grow up and be a manager at a fast food restaurant mm. like he was. And my mom said, don't be working and shipping and receiving at, you know, some warehouse. And, uh, so they, they, they always gave us that, um, they always told us to strive for more. Mm -hmm. You know, in today's day and age, people say is let, let our ceiling be your floor. Yeah. That's in essence what they would say to, to me. And uh, so in, in my growing up, we really didn't have, um, my dad really wasn't around much. Uh, my mom was always there. She's, mm -hmm. she's always been a servant. She's done everything that she possibly can for us. Uh, my dad really wasn't around a lot because he always worked. He always worked late at night and things of that nature. But uh, they, they, they taught me, the one thing that, that when I look back is they taught me to work. Mm. They say, if you want something, you have to work for it. Yeah. And uh, the, that's one of the examples, if I can say the one of the positive examples that I that I saw from them was that. That's awesome. I'm glad. I'm glad. And we can definitely see the fruit of that, not just um, in your life and not just in your marriage, but definitely in your kids, which um, one thing that we try to do in, in the vine is try to implement that that legacy in people, right? Because of course we're talking about dating and it's fun and like these little things, but mm -hmm. at the end of the day, the person that you end up with is part of your legacy when it comes to your children. Yes. So um, <clears throat> I'm glad that we're touching on this because a lot of the people that, um, just in the way that we're already foreseeing the way that this season is gonna go, I think um, just allowing people to see that it's generational things, right? Which mm -hmm. is what the enemy and what society is coming against. Yes. Just even today I was sitting with one of my coworkers and she's like, I'm never having kids. Like, I'm never gonna have kids. And she's like, it's just way too complicated and blah, blah. And I'm like, you know, that 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 sucks because mm -hmm. then you're missing out on just like what you're saying, like that yeah. pride that came over you where you get to talk about your kids' stories. Yes. You know what I mean? And if we can write books on the like, the things that they've overcome, I mean, Karina herself, like, wow. Um, so thank you for sharing that. So I think one of the most unique things about your marriage to Pastor Adriana is how you guys are complete opposites in your personalities, right? Pastor Adriana, she's vibrant, as we will see. <laughs> and just uh, next week, you guys are going to be able to see her interview. And you're subtle. You come in cool, calm, collected, right? And so, um, but it works with you guys, right? It works. And so, and I think the the way that we can credit that, what we can credit that to is the way that you both honor each other and the way that you guys are wired and in your servanthood towards one another. And so would you, would you agree with that? Like, yeah, I mean, I, I, I would definitely agree with that. I mean, this is, this is where they say, um, 
you complement each other, mm-hmm. right? When you meet, you meet the right person. Um, if you're exactly the same, then there's nothing that the other person can bring to you because mm-hmm. you're already it. Yeah. But uh, this is where, you know, people say opposites attract. Um, there was just so much of a compliment to, to who she is and who she was for me back when I first met her. Yeah. Um, and even, even now, I mean, one thing that was my wife is she's a constant motivator. She always sees the good in people yes. and she knows how to pull on that and pull it yeah. out. I'm the kind of guy that, you know, I, I would have been the guy that would have just came home and sat down on TV and watched TV. And as long as my bills are being paid, I would have mm. been perfectly happy. And uh, but um, but my wife always saw something more in me and always said, no, you can you can do this. You can do that. You can accomplish this, accomplish that. And because of that, you know, we've been able to have a better life. We've been able to be more fruitful because, you know, there's always a, a, she's always sees more and says, you know, don't settle for yeah. what you can, you know, what somebody's willing to give you. You can go out and get more. I love that. Yeah. So, and I completely agree with that. I think a lot of people that are even listening to you say that, that know her personally are like, yes, mm-hmm. absolutely. Yeah. And so <clears throat> how, <laughs> I love this story. So can you tell us how did you guys, how, I know I have it here worded as how did you fall for your spouse? But first let's start. How did you guys meet? Okay. <laughs> All right. So we're going to go there. Um, well, you know what? Uh, uh, it was, uh, I don't know if it was a Friday night, Saturday night. It was one of those things. Um, you know, I was out with some friends and we were just driving around. You know, some people call it cruising. Some people call it cruising. We called it evangelizing. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we were just going out there. And um, and just one day we, I saw this beautiful beautiful person in a car and you know we we started um talking back and forth as far as our friends with their with their car and so and so and uh and then at one point you know because we're cruising you're going back and forth anybody that's cruise you see how that whole thing dynamic goes and the next thing you know um they she pulls over she gets off and they, there's these things that used to be called a pay phone pay so phone, it wasn't phone. a cell phone that you had we actually had to go to a phone and put a coin for some of those that don't know what a coin is there's a metal round piece <laughs> And you would put that in the, in, in, in the machine and, you, and you'd be able to make a phone call. Mm-hmm. Well, she gets out of her car and she goes there. And um, yeah, let's just say she was very, very, very attractive. Okay. So <laughs> I wanted to make sure she was going to be safe. So right. my friends told us <laughs> to pull over and just, you know, to, to go make contact. I went over to go make contact with her. I went to go speak to her. And, you know, and, and, and for me at that time period, it was it, it was. I wasn't the type of person, like everybody in the car that I was with, they're the kind of people that they didn't, they could flirt with anybody and talk to people real easy, no problem. With me, it was always a challenge. And they, you know, this is, again, I had people that were motivating me and helping pushing me. And uh, so when I went to go speak to her, I went to go speak to her and I asked, you know, we went to exchange phone numbers and stuff. And um, it was an interesting uh, scenario. I go over to go write down on, uh, the phone number she had no space on a notepad you know nowadays people have a dash you know like on on their dash they have their cell phone there Mm -hmm. or a dash cam (laughs) she had a notepad and I was like why does she have a notepad here you know and uh and you start looking through the pages she's got all kinds of phone numbers written down (laughs) she had to write my number down on the cardboard on the last on the very back and I was like okay you know what she's just you know, she's just out here for the numbers, you know, to, mm. to you know, to keep score or something. Maybe those were but, her um, favorite Bible verses. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ask? <laughs> well, I didn't know, you know, you know, back then I wasn't saved. Right. So I don't know. You know what? Maybe that's maybe, what it was. Yeah maybe. yeah. maybe it was like, you know, the, so, something in numbers. Um, but uh, <laughs> but so it was just in, it was just interesting. It was funny at the same time. And uh, so but. Uh, at, at some point, um, I, I think I, wait, yeah, I waited maybe like 10 days or so. And then wow. I, I gave her a call. I gave her a call and um, it was you know, interesting. <laughs> what did she it, say? It, Please tell us. <laughs> don't leave it out. <laughs> okay. I love my wife. And I, she, I mean, it's my it, it worked part. and I still scored. So it was great. But uh, when, I first, when she first answered the phone, she said, how dare you wait so long <laughs> to call me? Mm. And, and I, I was taken back, but I was like, excuse me? She's like, how dare you wait so long to call me? She goes, you know how many people mm. 
would love to speak to me. And I'm like, well, I remember seeing I her. It. So I I'm like, her. I'm sure there's a lot yeah. because I saw <laughs> the notepad. Yeah. But, uh, but the, then we, we talked and we just, um, we, started, we, we just started joking. We were laughing. I forgot how long we stayed on the Aww. phone and we just spoke. We would speak for hours on the phone. And, um, and it was just it's such a great connection. And, and it, it was funny the way it all, it all happened. Yeah. But, uh, but, you know, I didn't know that at that time I was going to start evangelizing in that way. <laughs> and it was just amazing. And, and, I was, and I was blessed for it. Yeah. So I mean, praise yeah. God. You know praise what God. this reminds me of? Because <laughs> we got to bring it back to the Bible, right? Yes. Uh, you know, the way that your friends, they just had your back <laughs> and yeah. they were encouraging you. It reminds me of Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. It's so freaking funny. <laughs> it reminds me of those friends that sought their friends healing, and they yes. broke through a whole roof. Yeah, just to lower just him, to lower down, him down, down to the presence I, of I, Jesus. I felt as, as if I was being lowered down. You are correct. <laughs> I I could definitely see that. I could definitely see uh, that. And my heart was healed from that day forward. That's for sure. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Praise. <laughs> This is so funny. I love it. <laughs> uh, so funny. Okay. So next question is, has your marriage always been this successful? Um, look, nobody's marriage is always um, successful. Um, you, you're going to go through, through hills and valleys from time to time. There's going to be struggles, whether, it's, whether it be financial, whether it be with the kids, whether it be, you know, work, whether it be, you know, activities, whatever it may be, friendships that are, you know, that necessarily may not just be, you know, in the home. Yeah. It could be stuff from the outside. There's always some type of issue. There's always things that, that can happen. Um, and I, I could say the one thing that, you know, that that's helped us um, keep it together is that aspect of, you know, servanthood, being mm -hmm. about one another. And at the end of the day, it's about us both coming into agreement and making decisions that are going to benefit us and our family. Yeah. And uh, but it, but it's all about communication. Oh. So that's the one thing that you know my wife is a really really good communicator. Excellent. And and, uh, and the one thing that that I've learned is like you you never you're never going to resolve issues to be able to move forward unless you sit down and talk about them. And um, and I've been blessed that she's been that because. I could, you know, the world could be falling apart yeah. around me and I'll just keep moving forward because I'm so task oriented. Mm. Um, but my wife's like, no, you know, we need to make sure, you know, we got to make sure we're covered here, we're covered here, we're covered there. And it's, I just love it. I just love it because uh, she she helps. She's she's my true helper yeah. that really helps keep our family in line and keep us moving, moving in the positive direction. That's really good. And so... Um, a few questions that were not on the on the set list is, so I know that um, everything that you just said, so one, the first question that I want to ask you as a follow-up to that is, you know, obviously we do know that every, every relationship, whether it be a marriage, a work relationship, whatever the case may be, they all encounter difficulties, they all encounter yeah. challenges as you guys learn to know one another. And so, um, but I've noticed that um, in today's like society, right, like the dating and all that, there's been such a fear of getting into relationships because of what can happen. Mm -hmm. um, because what they call it now is like, you know, the risk versus the reward. And so um, what would you say to any like young man when it comes to that? Because there is going to be that yeah. hardship. So how would you encourage uh, like any man that's listening to this? And hopefully you are a man listening to this, taking this advice mm. yeah. um, to take the risk. Um, I would say the one thing to truly grab hold and when we look at like in Ephesians 5, right, mm -hmm. you know, we get the, the blueprint to what, what it looks like to be married and what you're supposed to do, right? And Ephesians 5, 25 is, you know, it says to remember, remember to love your wife the way Christ loved the church. Mm -hmm. And when you get a perspective of what that means, it's like, it's like, okay, does a church always act good? No. Well, the church acts up, right? <laughs> so there's there's always um, there's things that happen, but you have to remember to always love people through everything. And um, and when you we really gra take a step back and understand that that being a servant is is isn't is is a is something that you do all the time. Yeah. And being a servant is sacrificial love, and you have to be able to 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 work through those things where 
when when you you know when when you fail or when you come short and on those times where the, when everything's good mm -hmm. right and but you have to be able to have that sacrificial heart and understand that you still have to come together and you still have to love one another it's like one perspective that i love from um from john bevere is uh he said he had a he had a moment in his marriage where him and lisa weren't getting along mm -hmm. and uh and and god reminded him it's like lisa's my daughter mm -hmm. It's like, make sure to take care of my daughter. And, and that's a perspective that every man that wants to go into a relationship has to understand that that, that woman that you're, you're going into a relationship with is God's daughter. Yeah. And you have to make sure that you treat her right. Yeah, and vice versa, yeah. right? And so um, what are some like real life ways that you can say that you guys, if you don't mind sharing, the way that you guys serve each other, right? Because I feel like... In the world connotation, when we say the word servant, it comes with it comes with a negative connotation. It's like, oh well, like well, I'm their slave. Like, and it's not like that at all. Especially with like the dynamic between, we know that a mar uh, biblical marriage is um, submitting to one another. Mm -hmm. So, how would um, what are some examples that that you can give us that you guys in the way that you guys serve each other? Well, as far as the way we serve each other, I mean, obviously, you you have to respect one another. And that is an aspect of servanthood. Mm -hmm. I think in, in, in today's day and age, people don't take those things into consideration. It's like uh, respecting one another is truly loving one another, is being able to, to, to have each other's heart. Yeah. Um, I'm the kind of guy that, you know, I, I'll make my wife coffee. I, I iron her clothes. You know, I do that for the kids as well. I mean, it's, it's one of those things that me and myself, it's, it just comes natural to yeah. me to want to help each other and serve each other. Uh, but, you know, when you really look at the aspect of servanthood, it's like we have to understand that that servanthood is, is about, you know, uh, making yourself available mm. to the other person, um, their needs, their wants. You know, even even in sometimes, you know, if you understand their scenarios and where they're where they're at, you can foresee what's happening and what they need, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so as far as us at home, I mean, we, we're constantly trying to help each other out. You know, nowadays we, you know, with the kids and we have so much stuff going on, we're in communication about the schedule, who's doing this, who's doing that. And this is so that the, the there's a cohesiveness and there's a, a flow in the way things run. Uh, my wife is always, is, is, the way she serves me is, is like, you know, she loves on me. She always encourages me. She's always, you know, thinks so positive. I mean, she sees me as being able to take over the world. And it's like, it's just so, um, sometimes it's, it's not only humbling, but it's like, wow, it's like, I, I wish I could jump in her body mm. to be able to see the way she sees me. And it's like, it's, it's such a, a beautiful picture from when we look at, you know, the, um, the perspective of us being able to see that what Christ sees in That's us. So good, yeah. And, and uh, I get to, see, I get that tangibly at home all the time. That's amazing. And it's, it's amazing. And it's also, um, you know, sometimes it's, it gets scary. I'm like, okay, I know, I know you see that. I know I yeah. can do it because if you're telling me I can do it, I can do it. But, uh, but, but it is amazing and it's, it's beautiful. And that, that's one of the many ways that she serves me. That's awesome. I love that. Take notes. Uh, I'm taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So is there anything that you would like to add when it comes to servanthood before we move on to the yeah. next focus? Yeah, we can. Um, I, I wrote down a, a couple a couple things that would that help people to understand what real servanthood is. Okay. Um, number one, make themselves available to serve. Yeah, I like you that. know, um, one of the things that that we see in today's day and age, especially when we start talking about marriages, is in today's day and age, it's okay for either the man or the woman to just come home from work, you know, flop on a couch and just do nothing, mm -hmm. you know. And it's like um, that, that that's never that, that's not a servant mentality. Yeah. You know, a servant is somebody that comes home and is always trying to help on see what I can do. How do I fill in? How do you know uh, I can go and work, you know, 10, 12 hours of work. And then, you know, I remember when the kids were small, I would come home and it's like, OK, what's my wife would be cooking. And if anybody knows about my wife cooking, she doesn't just make, you know, uh, a plate of beans or a plate yeah. of rice. She made like a five course dinner yes. all the time. So there was always like a whole thing happening. Yeah. So I'd come in, wash dishes, you know, take care of the kids, do what, you know, change them, bathe them, whatever needed to be done. It's like, that's what you do. You know, you got to be a servant. You got to make yourself available. You can't just, you can't be, I mean, uh, uh, 
in today's day and age, a lot of men can become selfish yeah. where they, they don't want to serve. They feel like it's a job. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you kind of posed that a little bit earlier where you kind of mentioned to the, to the aspect that, that people, um, see it as, a slave. Yeah. And so if you go into a, a marriage and you feel like you're a slave, you're not ready to be married. Yeah. That's because good. Uh, in a marriage, it's about um, serving one another. And that's at that point, it's no longer about you. Yeah. It, it's like the whole aspect of salvation, right? Mm -hmm. When we get saved, we make that promise that our life is my life is not my own. I give it all to you, right. God. It's the same thing that you do when you when you make a covenant uh, before God and you marry somebody. You say, OK, my life is not my own. Honey, how can I serve you? Yeah. You know, so number one was is to make yourself available. Number two is uh, pay attention to the needs when God puts them in your path. You know, you have to be your awareness, your discernment has to be there when things when things are coming up that where uh, your your wife or your kids need to be you yeah. need to be served. Number three, do do your best with what you have. Um, this means paying full attention. This means um, you're not giving your spouse your leftovers, mm. you know, where you're, you're putting your focus and your energy on other things. And then when it comes down to spending time with your wife, it, it's like you're giving crumbs. Yeah. If you if you give crumbs to your marriage, don't expect it when it falls apart. Yes. Right. Don't be surprised when it does. That's um, okay. Number four, do every task with equal dedication. Um, and that's good and bad things. It's like everything that you do, you got to do it as if you're doing it onto the Lord. Yes. Right. Yeah. And uh, when we do things as if we're doing it onto the Lord, you know, they, we don't, you should never do anything for the reward. But if it, it but that's the way that, it, that you know for a fact is going to please God. Yeah. Right. So that's another one. Number five, um, be faithful to, to the ministry. And, and what I mean by that is your, your physical and, um, and emotional, uh, connection with your with your spouse mm. there must be you know you obviously when people get married there's going to be a physical connection right, right. Um, but the emotional connection that you got that you have to have and that's something that you have to work on yeah that doesn't just happen you don't just emotionally connect with your spouse naturally you you have to that has to be with purpose yeah and the way you do that with purpose is by having a servant heart yes right um and then the last one was um that was the last one actually so that would be that's so good Pastor some, some ideas. I feel like we can go off another hour just breaking those points down. But yeah. so what I want to do is, because um, obviously those are all amazing points. And so now what I'm picturing right now is like somebody that's just starting out, right? Because mm -hmm. some of our listeners are people that are just barely stepping into Christianity or just maybe have been Christians, but haven't been dating in the Christian way, mm -hmm. right? So when I when I hear those points to me, right, because I see tangible examples and I see how people do it in and out of the church, but to somebody that may not have that example, what kind of encouragement would you give them to start out? Like, for example, um, you mentioned, like, pay attention to uh, the way that, like, their needs that are going to happen. And obviously you learned what those needs were the more that you guys grew in your relationship, yes. right? So how w what would you say to them? So you're talking about just uh, people that are that are pursuing to be in the marriage? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, you know what? When as, as, If you think about the actual dating process, um, when, when I think about that, the first thing that pops into my mind is, is, is the, the whole analogy of, for those that have played sports, mm. it's um, every coach always tells you to practice the way you're going to play in the game. And if I can give somebody some type of advice, it's like, you know, you, you, you start practicing on those things that, um, on how you're supposed to treat yeah. your spouse. Um, you know, for women, it's different sometimes the way you treat your, your uh, the other uh, man and for man, the, the woman. But uh, you start practicing and start treating them as if you're already married. Mm. You know, because if, in, in essence, if you don't, the person that you're dating, if there's no intention for marriage, then there's really no point. Right. Right. So every relationship you go into, it should be with the intent to get married. So if there's one thing that I could say is, you know, pra is practice the way you're going to play. Which is the purpose of courting, right? It's so the it's purpose like, of courting. You know, you build that friendship and of course you're figuring out like, hey, is this something that I want, what I don't want? And then once you're you're both coming to that agreement and you actually step into the courting, then it's like, okay, is this somebody that I wanna that I'm that I'm down to serve, that I would love to just see them like prosper yeah. and all these things like um You know, what kind of advice we could give and I give the perspective of, you know, in basketball or, or any sport, they always tell you to practice the way you're gonna yes. play. And the reason you're going to practice the way you're going to play is because you're, you're going you're to have good habits, you're going to have bad habits. Mm. 
And in that dating process, this is where you start working out the kinks, start working out those things that, that you know, one or the other doesn't like yeah. from the other person. And this is where you start seeing, is somebody going to, um, are they going to adapt themselves and be a servant to the needs of one or the other? Yeah. And in, in, in that season, that's when you want to start working those things out to see if the other person is going to be marriage material or not. That's good. Yeah. Yeah, that's really good. I love it because it, it really is just learning one another, right? And it's what what um, what gets me is like obviously you learn you learn from previous relationships, right? But then it's always going to be different when you apply it here with somebody else. And so one thing that I've learned is like you gotta tune into what the Holy Spirit or what you guys are doing here, right? And so unfortunately, a lot of people think that there's like a template for a relationship it's like oh well this happened with so and so so why isn't it happening here or they start comparing what's going on with yes. them with other relationships but <clears throat> your marriage with pastor adriana is completely different from other marriages in the church that i've noticed and that i've you know um hung around and it's just like that's why you have to be so intentional with the person that's in front of you right mm -hmm. and just um and just that be intentional like you said practice mm -hmm. in and out all yes. right hot fire so next, what I want to focus on is mentoring, um, the way that you mentor and um, just that kind of influence that you have, because I think what a, what a lot of men are lacking in today's day and age is obviously fathers, right? Having strong male um, influences and everything. And so something that we've been focusing on ever since the first season is, hey, get connected to a mentor, get connected to somebody that can sow into your life. And so as a mentor... I know that you've helped walked a lot of, I say a lot, like if it's like crowds of people, but it's not, but it's one too many, right? Of people that have dealt with things like less like um, pornography addictions or whatever the case may be. And I think what happens is that society has like normalized it, right? They've normalized the less, the, the addictions and all these things because they make it seem like it's what men do. Yeah. And so um, I personally have seen the way that some men like they're like, oh, but once I get married, like all of that's going to it's going to follow like it's going to fall away because I'm going to have a spouse, whatever the case. And so. Tell me, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> <laughs> OK, um, yeah, you know, the, when people say uh, when I get married, those things are going to fall off. They're deceived. Yeah, um, they're, they're not willing to give up the struggle, or the sin you know, that they're in. Yeah. And uh, in, in my personal opinion, th that person is not ready to be married. Mm -hmm. If you think things are going to fall off when you get married, it's false. Because yeah. the enemy doesn't want to see a man and woman unite, especially in today's day and age, you know, where we, we, we're having a tough time even defining what a man and a woman right. is. Um, it, it, no, I, people need to deal with their, with their issues and need to deal with them now. I mean, statistics constantly are on the side of, People need to deal with these uh, any type of addiction, whether it's smoking, whether yeah. it's drinking, even even people that you know eating, you know um, they have eating eating issues. Yes. Um, there's always some type of issue in, in that sense, but especially when you start dealing with pornography and lust and things of that nature, you, you, you they're not going to fall off when you get married. Right. Um, you know they, this is where you have to truly understand that if you have a struggle with something of that like that, you really need to deal with it. Okay, so one thing that our church is really big on is talking, having these discussions, right? Having conversations about sex, having conversations about pornography, having conversations about all these things. Because, um, first of all, God was a creator of mm -hmm. sex, right? And I think a lot of people, the in the church, and I mean that in general, like the whole church, is such a topic that comes with a lot of shame, embarrassment, or you know, there's not a real healthy discussion with that. So, I think men that struggle with these kind of things they don't have that trust to go to somebody and be like hey like i'm struggling with this for one i don't think men um are comfortable enough for asking for help so how do you how would you motivate our listeners to to do that to ask for help to humble themselves in that way um for one i i i would say they need to have a fear of fear of mm -hmm. god you know and this is where there's a lack of fear of God. You know, um, there's, you know, we, we, we should be living a life where we have to understand that everything that we do in life should be glory yes. to God. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's the one thing that he asks of us to do. And when we, have, when we understand and we look into 
those types of scenarios, there's there's no way that you're going to glorify God in that. Yeah. So to think that you're going to deal with lust or uh, um, any type of sexual deviancy or sex before marriage and think that God's there with you, you're deceived. Right. You know, and that, and unfortunately in today's day and age, there's been so much um, so so much of, of watering of the word. Yeah. You know, and diluting it. Yeah. That it's 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 been a real disservice to people. And then later they have to try to overcome these traumas yeah. and they have to overcome these issues while they're married. Mm -hmm. You know, I was looking up at, um, there, was, there was a stat that I found and they said um, for men or women who have had like 10 or more um, sexual partners before marriage, the I think the rate was like almost 70% of those people divorce oh my goodness so their marriages were, are, are not going to be successful and then when you looked at the actual um marriages where they had one or less as far as partners it was like 90 percent as wild. far as success rate so it, it's it's one of those things where it's like you know some people um you know if you just look simply at the numbers i mean they don't lie and, right. and it's, it's like and you have to ask yourself why is that yeah and it's usually because of some type of trauma or issue like that and that's good because let's say if you're listening to this and you don't have that fear of the lord right like not yet but just these are statistics like this is number this is like not even god involved directly right where it's just like the numbers itself are showing you the proof <laughs> which even that destroys a lie where it's like oh i gotta try the product before you buy it it's like um, clearly no, because the numbers are showing you that that is what's really destroying marriages. And so how about you try marriage before? Let that be the product, right? Yeah. Um, so how do you think sexual sin goes directly against um, servanthood in a marriage? Um, you know, it, to me, it's one of those things where, like when you look at the, you know, going back to Ephesians, when you go back into Ephesians 5, uh, 21, it says, so submit to one another in fear of God. Mm. So, you know, when you look at the aspect of sin and servanthood, it's like if you're committing sin, then you're not you're not going to be able to uh, um, serve your spouse, you know, in the proper way. Yeah. You know, you have to be able to have that reverence of fearing God to make sure that you're honoring the person and make sure that you're doing the right thing and treating them the right way. That's a good Because there is an yeah. expectation. That is... Amazing, because it even goes back to what you said about how, you know, Pastor Adriana is God's child. And so the person that you're dating, whether it be your um, boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, it, like having that reverence, it's like, oh, my gosh, like God has made me a steward over this person. And I remember even in the last season, we were trying to focus on we con constantly reiterated um, that we're all made in God's image. Right. Yeah. So whether somebody that you like or don't like and somebody approaches you whether they like and you're like well this person is not handsome or whatever at the end of the day you still treat people with dignity because it's not according to your taste or like it's like that person has value mm -hmm. right and so i think um even in today's dating culture it's like sorry uh, our listeners from last season you guys are i'm repeating myself where it's like the seeds that you plant are is the harvest that you're gonna reap yes and so it's like in your marriage or whatever like you may not start seeing the fruit. So let's say you started a marriage and it's rocky. You sow those good seeds and sooner or later that harvest is going to yes. come in, right? Like just because it's, because I know a lot of marriages, actually a handful of marriages, I should say that started off rocky, but they were putting in those seeds of like, okay, like I'm going to do what the Lord has called me to do in this season, in this hour. And I, sorry, I know I veered off a little bit from the sexual sin, but no, it's not because the seeds that you're sowing as a single woman or as a single man is the harvest that you're going to reap. And so if you're protecting your body, if you're keeping yourself from sin even now, then those are, then you can expect a healthy harvest, whether it be physically, emotionally, or um, whatever the case may be with your wife or your husband, that's worth um, having self-discipline for. And if, so what if, right, they, they're listening to this and they're like, oh my gosh, like I've messed up. Like, I definitely have fallen into that. What kind of hope can you offer to that? Well, repentance. I mean, yes. repentance of your of your sins. You know, I, I mean, this is where the aspect that, I mean, we serve a God that's that's amazing. Yeah. That uh, we can go to and we can repent. And, uh, you know, and the aspect of repentance is going the other way. Yeah. So as long as it's true heart repentance, you know, not sorrowful repentance, yeah. uh, but true repentance where you, you know, you 
of course, you're going to go through the sorrow stage, but you need to make sure that you repent and yeah. you go the other way and you don't do again what you, you know, what just what you're yeah. being sorrowful for. Yeah, that's really good. And so can you, I know that Pastor John taught hot fire messages when it comes to this. Yes, um, I get, give credit to my wife. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, babe. Um, we're not going to be, uh, what is it? Plagiarizing here. <laughs> yeah, no plagiarizing. Um, especially when she's right here. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a little awkward. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I want to talk about that for a little bit because, in, you know, there's that quote, like you're not sorry, you're just sorry you got caught. Yeah. Right? Uh, and so... How so? Let's say somebody's like, "All right, I felt the sorrow. It's like, oh my gosh, like I wish I would have never fallen into that. I wish I would have never devalued somebody in that way." Um, turning around from that, like, how would you? What do you? So they repented. What do you think should be the next steps? Obviously, it's not going to be like a template where one, two, three. But what do you think would be some good first steps in order for somebody to be able to turn around from that lifestyle? Okay. Um, for, for me, um, so one of the things that I've helped other people with is usually um, the first step is repentance before God, right? Mm -hmm. And then the, to me, the next step is if you truly want to be healed from something like that, um, usually it's accountability. Yes. Um, and, and that's the hardest part because people do not want to be vulnerable. Yes. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't break out of their, their, the, the, those patterns. Mm -hmm. They jump right back into those patterns and it, it all ties back into not having somebody that's going to hold them accountable. Yeah. And I don't mean accountable, like just, uh, just to, you know, watch them, you know, to tell them when they do wrong. I'm talking about somebody accountable that's not, that's going to pray with them. Mm -hmm. It's going to pray for them. It's going to help them, mm -hmm. encourage them, build them up. You know, we, we're, we're not called to be believers and just live our lives on our own. Yeah. You know, we need the body of Christ, right? We need, you know, iron sharpens iron so that it sharpens the countenance of one another, yeah. right? This is all part of, you know, God's plan is like, you know, he knew that we were going to fall. Yeah. But he knew that we, together as a body of Christ, we have the answers to help one another get back up. Yes. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's good. It reminds me of that scripture, which a lot of people equate it to dating relationships, but I think it can be equated to all sorts of relationships, the, to not be unequally yoked. Right. So the the image of that, um, which, again, I remember this from a Bible study in San Fernando that you, that uh, Pastor Adriana brought this illustration out, where it's like um, the yoke, right? And so when two oxes are yoked to one another, it's like you have the seasoned ox and then you have the ox that they're barely, barely putting into the plow. Mm -hmm. So the story of that, the illustration of that is that the um, seasoned ox is like teaching this younger ox how to do the job. And so that's exactly what it is. It's like, and they walk together, they do the job together. And by that communion, by that yoking is that the younger ox is able to learn the tools of the trade per se. And so for men, I know that it's been, it's harder. I mean, I have an idea, but obviously I can't say like, oh, I know the fullness thereof. But I know that for men, it's definitely difficult to find that brotherhood or that camaraderie where they can be um, vulnerable, as you say, because as women, like, I think we expect it to be like, because, you know, we can get cafecito and it's a grand old party. But for you guys, it's different, right? Yeah. Um, from what I've heard, from what I've seen, from what I've been told, it, it, it happens more like, you know, while working, while the camp, like not the campfire, but like just doing things that men like to do. And that's usually where the vulnerability comes in because you learn to trust each other in doing the work. Yeah. Is that, is that so like what? It, it, it is, it, it can. I mean, usually those types of scenarios, you, you really have to work on building them. As far as when mm. you're working with men, you really have to create that type of atmosphere. Um, usually the campfire and all that stuff. Yeah. That's usually not the time that a man's <laughs> going to open up. Yeah. Um, it, not, not saying that it doesn't happen, yeah. but usually it's more a uh, closed door. Usually it's more uh, a private type of setting, mm -hmm. uh, things of that nature. But, uh, you know, w w when it comes down to it is even with the aspect of accountability, mm -hmm. you can't really help anybody that's not willing to work to get their healing. Mm -hmm. You know, um, one of the things that, that I do when I do the mentoring is I leave it up to the I leave it up to the person that's seeking mentorship yeah. to seek out the mentor. Yeah. Because I can't just yoke them to me right. and, and bring them along. I wish I could yeah. for a lot of times, but I can't do that. So it has to be purposeful from on their end because no matter what you tell them to do, if they're not hungry for it, they're not gonna they're not gonna do it. Yeah. And uh, this is where an, an aspect of you you have to make sure that you know. Um, the when you really want to get healed in something, you're gonna run after it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. 
Absolutely. I agree with that. So I know we kind of covered this already, so I'm going to let you, I'm just going to ask it and you can answer it however you want. What advice would you have for those men who don't see value in serving before marriage? You're not ready. Hmm. Yes. Not ready. I mean, if, if somebody's not willing to serve, I mean, I'll say this to a man or a woman. If the person that you're, that you want to marry is not willing to serve you and sees like kind of going back to that thing, sees it as them being a slave, they're not ready. You yeah. should run from that person because that person is not ready to fully sacrifice themselves to you. You know, in a, in, in a marriage, it's, it, you know, when we, when we do the weddings, you know, we, we always teach on the aspect of, you know, you, you, you have to bring in 100% and 100% on yeah. both sides to be able to make it work. You can't bring 50 and 50 to make 100. That doesn't work. You got to come in 100% of your effort. But you, it needs both people to make this whole thing work. Yeah. And if you don't have that mentality on how, how are you going to make things better? How are you going to build your relationship? You should be purposeful on the aspect of growing more and more and more and more. Yeah. Uh, not only with your spouse especially early on in a marriage. Uh, that's when it's, you know, uh, uh, if we could go back, you know, uh, my wife and I to the very beginning, we would be more, you know, cause we weren't saved. Mm -hmm. We would be a lot more purposeful in that time period that we had alone yeah. compared to, you know, like when you have kids, things change, the dynamics change, you know, kids have to go to school, they have games, they have recitals, they have this, they have that. And it gets crazy. And, 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 and then at that point, you really have to be even more purposeful to stay connected with your spouse. So if somebody at the very beginning has a hard time uh, serving another person, then for one, I'd question that if they're saved, I'd question their <laughs> salvation. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'd question it because, you know, to me, it's, it's one of those things that I've never I've never understood as yeah. um, as a believer and as a servant yeah. that you can be in a room where things are happening mm -hmm. and people can just sit and do nothing. Yeah. It is, it is never made sense to me. It's like, how can, how are you not trying to help here? Yeah. How are you not trying to do something to love on somebody else? Right. You know, when you see some people that are working or doing whatever, um, it's just one of those things. And yeah. I guess it's just part of my heart on, on who God made me to be. Yeah. That's really good. I love it. Why should men sign up for the In the Vine dating mixer coming up? Um, well, I mean, look, I believe in the, in the question that you had posed to me was to do it in person, right? Yes. To meet in person. And I mean, it, there's a whole lot of dynamics. I mean, this is where you can't really discern when you're doing things, you know, if you're doing, uh, uh, what do they call it, uh, uh, christianmingle.com or any, <laughs> yeah. uh, anything of that nature, you really, you really don't understand. You can't use your discernment fully on what yeah. that, you know, how that person is and things of that nature. You need to have that interaction. Yeah. You really need to do that, um, that in-person connection to see, you know, whether this person, you know, is even in the, in, in the right state for you, yes. you know? Um, so I would definitely say if you, if, if for those that are seeking a, a relationship, you know, definitely do something that is in person. Yeah. yeah. At some point, like you're going to have to be in person. Like you can't. Yeah. You're going to have to meet them at yeah, some point. Yeah. Might as well just, yeah. Might as well just do it. Because people lie. Yeah. <laughs> people say they're six foot five. Next thing you know, they're five, six. And they're like, <laughs> Oh, they just flip the numbers. Oh, sorry, oh, sorry, I put that in wrong. My bad. You know, it was, it's like, my bad, I put it website. in wrong. Yeah. yeah, it was the website. Yeah, so it's like, no, come on. Yeah, yeah. no, you're absolutely right. And Nothing against people that are five, six. Yeah, right. God loves you. He loves you. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Father Abraham, Pastor Abraham. We are so excited, um, again, just to be able to let you just pour out for all these men and women. Um, is there any final thoughts that you want to leave us with? Um, yeah, as far as, uh, as far as marriage is concerned, is um, it's the most beautiful and most rewarding thing that you could ever do. God, when he created Adam and Eve and he told them to be fruitful and multiply, um, the aspect of fruitfulness, you will never experience such beautiful joy until you get married and you really go through the aspects of life and to see what what God um, allows us to create and to build in the legacies you know for the future generations is just amazing and um, I just I just love it I love the journey you know and, and I just I love doing the journey with my wife and my wife is my best friend and and for those that are seeking a relationship, is make sure that that person is your best friend. 
And I am just so grateful and thankful that God gave me a best friend, gave me a not only a beautiful wife, you know, but an amazing wife with a great heart. So that's what I would say. Our live studio audience is also. <laughs> <laughs> um, we can't agree anymore. So as always, thank you so much for tuning in for Who's in the Vine. Pray for your single friends. It's hard out here. And in order to purchase a ticket for the In the Vine Dating Mixer coming up, go to inthevinedating.com. And if you want to connect with us on Instagram, it is at inthevine.dating. So we hope to talk to you soon, and we hope to see you soon. Take care. Thank you.